everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Vanderloos, one of the GFP faculty, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Myra Satterfield, who is associate professor in Sala and soon to be director. Chair. 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 I don't want to be <laughs> But that's fine. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, a couple of things I wanted to get out of the way before I start. Um, when I present, I tend to make slides when I get nervous. So there are a lot of slides we're going to move through. Because um, when I don't know what to say, I just make more images. I'm a visual person in that way. Another thing I want to do through the talk is try to give you a sense of the way that architects think about research. I think it's different than um, what a lot of other bodies within the university do. One of the reasons for that is we're a profession first, and our program is, is focused on building professionals. Our terminal degree is a master's degree, and then licensure is probably the equivalent of getting a doctorate or a PhD. So one of the results of that is we don't have access to funding and financing the way that a lot of other bodies within the university do. So the way that we do research traditionally or typically is by getting commissions outside and actually working on projects in the field. So our funding tends to be lower. We tend to do a bit of bootstrapping. And we also have the, the problem that what we do is really slow. So if you think about people doing biological research, it's easier to do genetic research on a fruit fly because you get multiple generations. We make elephants. It takes a long time for something to come to term. We learn from our mistakes over the course of years as opposed to weeks, days, months, things like that. So that out of the way, I operate in two worlds. I have the, the practice human that was described and also the HILO lab. Um, human practice is really focused outside. It's my bridge to clients in, in the world writ large. And then HILO lab is a newer entity that I made inside. That's clearly me. Um, and I guarantee that's what my partner looks like. Human is almost 20 years old. So we've been doing work in digital fabrication since the late 90s, which at the time made us novel, and now we're pretty commonplace and kind of seen as, as the old guard of that type of work. Hilo Lab is newer. That's the inter internally facing body at UBC. And then there's another group called MinLab that operates out of the University of Minnesota, where my partner is the head of the School of Architecture. Um, we think in terms of a distributed practice. So human is a homophone. It's a mashup of Hugh from Houston and Min from Minneapolis, which is where the two of us were residing when we formed the firm. Um, and it's also intended to represent the kind of way we thought about organizing our teams. Very typically, practices are built like I would hire five of you. We would have an office, and we would take work as it came to us. Um, Mark and I have really worked hard to think collaboratively and pull people from outside into our 
projects based on what their skills are and what they can bring to things for us. And we have a, a kind of running joke that we're perfectly happy being the two slowest guys on the team, that surrounding ourselves with smart people who know how to do things and helping them figure out how to, to deploy and organize seems to be one of our strengths. So in research, I do a lot of work in full-scale prototyping. I'm, I'm typically interrogating wall assemblies and using various tools, computer numerically controlled mills, 3D printers, uh, thermal formers, things like that to produce things. But I'm also coming from a background in practice. So prior to moving to UBC, this is my first full-time teaching job. I was directing more conventional practices in Houston, Texas for about 17 years. And I was doing everything from building schools and institutional buildings to parks and landscapes to working with clients in the private sector. And it's through working with clients, and these are, some of them are probably recognizable to you, some of the groups that I've done projects for, I really started to think about working itself as a territory for research. And specifically, it's, it was while working with Royal Dutch Shell and Exxon Mobil that I started to think about the kind of scale of what I was involved in as an architect and how little control and say I had within the realm of my own practice. So the thing that interests me about oil isn't oil itself. It's the way that the petroleum industry thinks about the territory of its own production. It controls all phases of work from extraction to the movement of those resources to all of the R&D and the work that goes into converting a raw resource into a sellable item, whether that's oil or plastic or whatever that might be. And what that means is they wield a lot of control and influence because they control such a big segment of that area of production. Architects do not effectively move upstream or downstream. That's a photo collage, that's not a real thing because somebody's <laughs> freaked out by that. We, in relation to the kind of entire, if you talk about it as a kind of cradle to grave mapping of the area within which we work, we occupy a very, very tiny territory. And as a result, our phase of work tends to be precious and tends to be small. We do nothing with material sourcing traditionally, all the way through to the parts that we assemble. We have a design phase, and then it goes into construction and, and pass to brokering and occupation. We tend to have a very small voice in that area as well. So what my research is, is focused on is not just the things that I'm manipulating, but how it inserts itself into the stream and how um, we as designers can start to think about how we expand that territory of work and increase the amount of influence that designers have over the built environment. One of the ways I think we need to start doing that is by thinking less about aesthetics and about kind of rules of the things that we make. This is Mies van der Rohe who famously co-opted the term less is more, I think in 1947, to talk about the virtues of minimalism in design. And so one of the most loathed things I think among the general population are modern buildings. Architects love modern buildings because there's this sort of purity and a, a kind of honesty we would say to the aesthetic of it. I'm not thinking about less is more as much as I'm thinking about loss is more. When I say loss, I'm not talking about losing in a traditional sense, like we failed, but I'm thinking more about strategically giving up to control a situation, right? And so recently we hear a lot about losing. As an American, I'll get a little into politics. Thankfully, last Tuesday, we didn't lose as badly as I was worried we would. But recently, we talk a lot about losing resources. Um, energy is becoming more scarce and, and kind of problematic. There's a loss in value in what we actually produce. We're losing labor and kind of contact and, and access to controlled labor, identity, context, things like that. But I think by giving up kind of the stranglehold on expertise and control, giving up certain degrees of influence to bring in outside collaborators, and giving up our adherence to predictability, we can actually move the needle a little bit. This part should go fast because you're all familiar with where you live, I hope. We live here in Vancouver. 
we work here at the end of the peninsula. It's an amazing spot geographically, aesthetically. Um, we have a kind of an embarrassment of riches and resources and access to things. But in terms of a built environment, it has some real problems. One, it's landlocked. Aside from the valley, we have no real natural place to expand. Um, it's a recreational haven. It's beautiful. It's a desirable place to be. And there are very kind of few limits on access to the real estate that's here. So as a result, a city that was originally built basically as a port and a center for resource extraction has turned into a destination city. And I'm kind of building context, because as an architect, my kind are largely responsible for all that you see on the screen. So as a destination city, that's become an issue. We've had a, a pretty remarkable increase in population on the left. And as a result, we have a lot of pressure on the built environment. And a lot of that pressure is due to rampant speculation on real estate. Right? It's the only thing people talk about in Vancouver, other than the mountains. Um, <laughs> Stats from 2015 estimated that 66,000 plus homes were vacant in the city of Vancouver. That represents almost 6.5% of the total built space in the city. At the same time, there's a 0.9 vacancy rate. So any of you who've been looking for places to live, you know that it's a punishing environment. Also as a result, there's this ridiculous and unsustainable upward pressure put on the value of land. And I would argue that it's a completely artificial construct, this value that we're talking about. Um, but this is basically trying to graphically represent the cost of a single family home. So those of you who were fortunate to land here in the 90s might have been able to get into real estate. But those of you who came here last year, you're hooped unless you're rich. Um, it's estimated in 2015 that 100,000 um, foreign millionaires live in Vancouver. Puts a ridiculous amount of pressure on the system. That $12.7 billion worth of the real estate transactions that happened in 2015 alone happened from people who don't live in Vancouver. Right? You can kind of go on and on down the list. So a single family home at that time was $1.2 million and there was a 40% increase in the value of homes. So we've become a hedge city. This is where we hedge our money. People who are wealthy come here to deposit the capital. And there are consequences to that. One of the big consequences that we tra track in the architecture school is that over 1,000 homes a year are demoed and put in a landfill in Vancouver. That it's estimated that 218,000 tons of waste wood is produced by the construction industry. That's in 2015 alone. That across North America, 20% of the waste generated in all of North America comes from the construction industry. Whether it's demolishing things, all of these great brutalist buildings, which are the only buildings that I think people hate more than modernist buildings, like the big concrete ones that are scary, like the MOA, <laughs> my favorite kind of building. Um, I have to build an entire building out of wood in order to cast that concrete. I build a structure, which is basically a, an above ground swimming pool, I pour concrete into it, I tear the wood down and probably throw it away. That's how that's done. Hugely wasteful process, right? But 29% of that material is untreated dimensional lumber, some use. So one of the things that my lab is investigating and is arguing that this loss, this destruction, could be an opportunity. And instead of focusing on what we make, like the aesthetic of it, the beauty of it, the delight that you can find in it, what I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about today is how we think about the problems that we're engaging, how we organize, where we see opportunity, what we give up, and where we actually want to focus our work that's different from what we traditionally do. So can losing be a form of anarchy, can we actually see loss as a type of disruption and change the way that we engage the world by doing so as we work in the wake of global capitalism and consumerism. Which brings me to Pop House. So what I'm going to do really is try to quickly go through two project streams that are feeding into a kind of concluding project. So I'm trying to limit what I'm telling you about, but go a little bit deeper into how we're operating these spaces. POP stands for paper or plastic, which is a 
common term in the cons consumer world. Um, and Pop House is a proposal for researching, understanding, and mining waste streams as sources of material for architectural construction. This requires collaborative material research and the development of digital and analog tools and techniques that will allow designers to manipulate waste materials with refinement and efficiency. So pop quiz. These are the questions that we ask as we're working. So in architecture, who or what has control over material production? Traditionally, it's been this sort of 20th century industrial machine that pumps out products that we assemble. When I'm in a bad mood, I sort of describe myself as the world's most expensive scrapbooker. <laughs> like I pull two by fours and chipboard and I kind of collage them together into things. I don't make anything in a, in a way, at least traditionally. Where are the points of control? If we can identify those, we can potentially have some influence over them. What are the ethical implications of current construction practices? And is it possible to impact our entrenched network of material consumption and production? So I'm going to talk to you about two different projects. One deals with plastic. The other deals with two by fours. So kind of seemingly mundane things that I think could be really interesting. So the first project is called Breaking the Mold. I'm going to take you through hex wall and varvac wall, which is a variable vacuum forming wall. This nice lady is showing you things that are thermal form. So vacuum forming is used to make a variety of things. I'm kind of looking around. The speaker case, the chair you're probably sitting on, dashboards, jacuzzis, airplane parts, camera that's filming me. A lot of things are made through thermal forming. And the strategy of thermal forming is pretty simple. You create a mold. In this case, the mold's being made out of MDF. If you have big runs, they're typically made out of metal. The mold is really, really expensive. It costs a lot of money and resource to produce. And then you take a material, typically plastic, although you can thermoform other things. We're working on trying to thermoform wood. Um, you heat the plastic, suspend it over the mold. You drop that sheet of plastic over the mold. You apply a vacuum to that sheet of plastic. It sucks the air out from between the mold and that sheet of plastic, and the plastic basically has to assume the form of the mold that you put in place. It's a great 20th century technology because it's driven completely on the idea of mass production, driving down the cost of an object. Right? So if you make one of something this way, it'll cost whatever the mold costs. So let's say it's a $10,000 mold, you've got a $10,000 speaker container or water bottle. If you start making hundreds of thousands of these things, you start to get into the realm of pennies on the dollar for the investment, which is great if you want to standardize. One of the big problems we run into, architects are not trained to standardize. We're rewarded for novelty, and we're taught to design specific solutions to local site problems, right? So the building industry, the logics of finance, the logics of money basically work completely counter to what designers traditionally are taught to do and the way that we're built to think. So to combat this, in the Varvac series, we began to attack the mold because we saw the mold as the point of, that was the big problem with the process. So what we tend to do is take on projects, often seemingly mundane projects, like a bathroom in Buffalo, New York. And Mark and I will work with a client. We'll get paid in a traditional way. We'll help them redesign a house. And then we'll basically horse trade with them and say, look, if you let us do what we want for this wall, we'll cut the cost of the final project by whatever that kind of range of research is. And we'll give you something novel. We've been pretty lucky. We have clients that allow us to do that. So we took something. We tried to pick the most mundane part in the house, but a place where all of us spend a lot of our time contemplating probably walls like this. And we began to look at it in terms of program. When I talk about program, it's very different than the way that most of you in this room talk about program. When I say program, I mean use. The program of this building is it's a teaching facility and a lab. I think about how things move through the building, but we use the term program to describe that. In this case, the bathroom is comprised of a series of things that you shouldn't have to describe. You think about it, bathrooms. And we began to map those programs and spatialize them on a wall surface, purposely trying to do something difficult and topographical. So those are iterations of a kind of formal wall that we're putting in place. 
And here you can see that the wall bul bulges, it pushes, it pulls to allow space for legs, toilet paper, air movement, things like that. And we were purposely doing something challenging exactly because we wanted to test our ability to manipulate the mold to allow us to do that in an affordable way. So our first pass at this, we designed a piston-driven mold that we were running off of a grasshopper script. So we're doing 3D modeling to get that formal relationship and to test it. There's a software, I don't know if you're familiar with modeling software, it's called Rhino, Rhinoceros. It's a 3D modeling software that came out of the industrial design industry. It's becoming increasingly commonplace in architectural practice. It's open source, which is kind of a great thing because people write add-ons. There's a whole zoo that goes into Rhinoceros. One of them is Grasshopper, which is a scripting script that's actually named for Grace Hopper. Um, but they've turned this into a menagerie. So Grasshopper allows us to do sort of scripting where we're not actually writing code, we're plugging pre-written bodies together to manipulate form. There's also Kangaroo that deals with material behavior, Firefly deals with heating and cooling and those types of things. So we're able to actually simulate quite a bit through the computer in that way. So we're writing Grasshopper scripts to formally change that <coughs> surface and then outputting it to a basic spreadsheet form that's telling the piston-driven mold where to put those pistons in space. We slaved that to an old thermal former, and we began to test it against sheets of plastic. And there's a learning curve there. The plastic doesn't want to do what you want it to do. You're forcing it to behave in a certain way, which is an important point. But in the end, we were able to actually construct an entirely um, varied wall surface using one single mold. It's still too expensive and still too controlling. So we got interested in the failures of what would be perceived as failures in the process. And we started to look at what the material wanted to do instead of solely what we wanted to make the material do. So places where we got lofting or loss of re resolution or warping, we began to think, well, could we amplify that? So that took us to Farvac 2, where we gave up a good deal of control. We do precedent studies and research like anybody. This is a great one. It's the Phillips Brazil Pavilion from the 1958 World's Fair by Le Courbusier. The thing that's really interesting to me about this is the mold is completely variable and free. It's a sandbox. And he built a project that's essentially eight hyperbolic paraboloids that tilted into place and locked together using a sandbox and manual labor. So it was an extremely cheap way to build a highly complex formal building. And the technique of construction is essentially the same that's used to make a big box store. So anytime you go into the Kmart, that's all cast flat. It's called tilt wall, it tilts up, makes a box. He's tilting up to make a really complex form. Some other great examples, there's a Polish researcher out of ETH Zurich that's inflating steel. So if you bought that chair, it would come rolled up like a bicycle inner tube, and you pump it up, and poof, you've got a chair. He's starting to work full scale. He's actually building a bridge in Europe using the same technique. Super material efficient because the material's in tension and it's optimized by being inflated. So it's completely balanced. It's not doing something really stupid, like going straight up and straight across, which a beam and a column works, but you need to over-engineer it to get it to do that. Some other examples, Miguel Fizak used fabric to form concrete in the 50s, and then a couple of guys out of California, Andrew Cudlis and, and uh, Marcus, who were doing work with soft forms. Again, a better project for us, in this case, the School of Architecture at Minnesota. This is the entry lobby, modernist building, Really nice building, um, but very acoustically <coughs> live. So your reception person sits here, students queue up there, there's a lot of sound bounce. So we were asked to do something with that wall that helped mediate the acoustic problem, but also created something aesthetically interesting. We do what architects do, we made an as-built. We drew the wall, identified things on the wall that we had to be aware of and accommodate. And then we began to map sound over the top of it. So what you're seeing here is a, a mapping, kind of basic, we brought in an acoustician, but a mapping of places where we want a high degree of absorption. 
as one strategy. We had a binary strategy for attacking the problem of sound. The higher the degree of magenta, the more absorption. The higher degree of white, the more scatter, right? Then we started to look at the mold itself, and we radically simplified the mold. So we built an entire wall project using a frame of plywood with wires strapped across it. And the idea there is that we were taking the heated plastic and allowing it to slump and find its own form. Um, we did material testing where we had two variables. We're dealing with the thickness of the material that we're working with and also the time under the heat lamp. And we were able to get draws of close to a foot just with gravity and heat, which is kind of interesting. So what we did then is we set up a rule set where if we could get a draw that was deeper than six inches, we would cut that off, we would top it, which is what this is showing. This is a finished piece that's been cut. When we cut it, it exposes felt that's applied to the wall behind, and that's where we get absorption. So soft material, if you've ever been in a padded room, it's acoustically dead. That's because that soft material is absorbing sound. And then we wanted, through the wires, we could get a high degree of scatter because we're making a highly topographical surface that's giving us directional bounds. So if you threw a ball at that wall, you wouldn't know exactly where it would go. It's scattering, and sound is vector-based, like balls. Mm -hmm. um, so as we cut things, we get exposure. The deeper the draw, the more of the exposure. So then we start playing with the computer, and you can probably see in here there are square patterns that are showing up on the system. That's the mold itself. So that's the unit that we're building to. We basically ask the computer to randomize the wire pattern with the rule that where there was more magenta, we needed more space because we wanted to treat deeper draw because we wanted to know we could cut things off. That makes sense. So it should be pretty apparent that the, the pattern gets tighter where the, the system or the image is white. It gets more open where it's not. And as a result, we have a completely variable wall surface made from a very simple mold that performs acoustically and also aesthetically. One of the things that's kind of interesting to me about the project as an architect is that the project went over bu budget for the furring strips. And we're way under budget for the part that traditionally would have busted the bank on the project. So we flipped the field on that. The sign was the most expensive part of the whole. And you can kind of see the, the aesthetic that's born out of it. We didn't know what that aesthetic would be. That's part of what we're arguing. We could, we could begin to relinquish this sort of predetermined, I'm going to build the world in this image that I imagine, and move upstream from that a little bit and start to play with the process that informs how things get produced and come up with an aesthetic that's potentially more closely related to the problem at hand. So Blair, what about pragmatic, like clean? It's actually plastic. I mean, except for the felt part, you could turn a hose on it. And so people can just come up and wipe it down. It's really stout. It's, it's a lot like that, just a hard plastic surface. It would have taken 40 unique molds to get that project built. So tending to think graphically, we reduced not only the time and the effort that goes into the project and the amount of, uh, of work that would go into designing each of those panels individually, we also completely eliminated the material that went into the mold itself. So we've been building on that and pushing on that. So my RAs are now trying to make form work out of ice, which would eliminate waste entirely, except for the energy needed to form the ice. I'm really trying to convince my director to let me buy a, uh, to put a CNC mill inside a freezer. <laughs> which is my, my dream, but it's, it's going OK, getting there. The students here are seeing if they can form the ice only using hot water, which obviously has a resolution issue. But one of the ideas that we're playing with is that if we could make a series, let's say we make three molds that have a really high fidelity, uh, high degree of ornament, we could completely cast a room, deal with wayfinding things like, wayfinding things like that with aesthetics. So imagine if each of these panels was thermal formed. And we had high resolution, so the first draw over the ice near the doors. And then as we, be, we continue drawing, you begin to lose resolution because that ice would melt. 
and that figural field would turn to flat, and then we could return to figural. You could basically render an entire ceiling with three molds that had no garbage at all. The, the latest version and the one that we're going to deploy in the project eliminates the mold entirely by inflating plant panels. So in this case, we're looking at recycled plastic waste on campus, um, a very abundant material source, lids to coffee cups, things like that, that we can turn back into sheets and then inflate. So what we're doing here is we're taking plastic, dissolving it in acetone, which renders it into a kind of liquid state that's sticky. We're then doing structural analysis with a software called Scan and Solve. So we, we take a flat sheet, we do uh, analysis on it to see where we would need support for that to span if we're supporting that sheet at both ends. This is, again, a floppy piece of plastic that we're working with in sheet form. We're transferring that pattern to the plastic itself. And then we have the students designing their own tools to apply that liquid plastic to the surface. So they're basically mapping and applying plastic that's been melted, same material as the sheet, dissolved, not melted, um, doing prep work. So here what Seb and Stu are doing is they're making a seam around the outside and then they're making kind of points of contact where two sheets get glued together. The idea is that we're leaving a kind of capillary system in place. We then, you've inserted a nipple into this thing, we heat it on the thermoformer, we inflate it. The one on the right, that, that's right for you guys, no, that's left. The one on the left is one where the plastic and the acetone was left on too long, it begins to, to bubble and foam. But a series of patterns where we're testing kind of its, its efficiency, its ability to either oil can or deflect or also bend, but we've been able to render just simple sheets of plastic structural. And the great thing about it is once we're done, we can take that, the acid tone dissolves away, we can just put that into a chipper and turn it back into a sheet of plastic. So what this makes us think about is can we think of buildings not just as places where we assemble materials and we throw it away, could we take waste streams and sequester them on site. So if you thought of a building more like a detention pond and less like a construct, you could start to think about the fact that instead of using your, drinking your coffee, throwing your lid away, that lid goes into a landfill, we could hold that lid on site at another point as part of an architectural skin for a couple of years, then it goes into the landfill. That's already helping, it's moving the needle, we're keeping things we're extending the useful life of a material that way. If we can continue that cycle even further to the point where hopefully we're not using plastics in this way, but we have waste that we can deal with, we're trying to think not just about our building as an endpoint for that material, but how it moves through a system as a cycle. Which takes me to the last kind of focused area of research, which is the zippered wood project. So in this case, all of that wood waste, the 29%, um, dimensional lumber that comes out of construction demolition. We're really interested in how we can productively take that material and formally trans change it. So that it becomes more specific for us and also so that we can start to think about damaged and broken two by fours as things that we can deploy on a site a second time. The wood is typically better than what we get now because it's probably from older growth forest. It's stable because it's dry. It's been sitting in a closed context for a long time. Um, so throwing it out is really kind of a criminal thing. It's also really apparent to us that we're competing with light frame construction, which is still our mode of operation for good reason. It's extremely flexible. It's extremely cheap. It takes a very, very low skill level to put together. And so it resists change. So basically, I would argue that the houses that we build are still kind of horse and buggy compared to our cars, which are far more sophisticated. Our clothing is more sophisticated than what we traditionally would do 50, 100 years ago. Construction resists that. And it's because tooling and changing is really expensive, and there's still a lot of profit to be made holding your ground. So we started this with elaborate form work. And what we're doing here is we're cutting veneers out of two by fours, bending them around form work and gluing them. 
so that we can get novel shapes, right? But super wasteful, We're cutting half of that wood away. It's also not strong. You're relying on the glue to do the work, not the material anymore. And we have to build culls, basically form work over which we're making these pieces. So every time we want to make a new form, we have to cut that form. So we began to look in kerfing. I actually brought pop props. This is that piece of wood. Kerfing is a really simple technique where you cut material out of a two by four. This is a two by four, but what it does is it renders it flexible. It's flexible along an axis. So I can make a barrel out of this, but I can't do much else. Um, and the, the thing that's also problematic about a curved piece of wood is that it's weak. It basically just leaves the veneer in place. So the strength of the wood is dictated by the thickness of that band on the back of it. We didn't like the fact that the kerfing kind of had a, had a limited scope or range, so we started to play with different ways of kerfing. One was cross-cut kerfing. The next one and the one that became most interesting is one that had an eccentric curve. And the two lines that I want you to pay attention to are this, which is a line that cuts directly across, perpendicular to the edge of that two by four as an axis of, of bending, and then the eccentric bending. So this two by four is kind of a radically bent two by four, right? Again, problematic because if I go this way, all of those joints are in tension and it wants to pull apart. If I go that way, it's strong. So please don't go that way. But you can see I can get a pretty sophisticated bend out of that. And the other thing that's important about the, that bend is I can actually predict what that bend will be. I can go and say I can make that piece, whereas with kerfing, it's more open-ended. That led us to a kind of an aha moment. What if we cut? teeth instead of curves, and actually tried to make two by fours that could zipper together. So we started this in an analog way. We're cutting prismatic rulings using just a crosscut saw, right? Then a mating piece, and we're seeing if we can bend a two by four with a tooth pattern. We're now going back into the computer and building models of that in the computer and trying to find a way to bridge the gap. We're doing this towards a solution. So we're teaching the computer how to think about two by fours, and we're teaching two by fours how to bend. And having some degree of success. So here we're putting together two patterns and seeing if we can get it to go. Um, we start moving towards faceted teeth that we're milling using a CNC mill. But the dilemma that we're running into is how do we get this kind of bend in a way that a designer could go in and start with the bend of the two by four hit a button, output a cut pattern, and then move towards assembly. Right? That's the challenge that we're trying to bridge, and one that kind of moves into your realm. So one of the things we had to do is start to tell the computer what our limits were. So pretty simple diagram is that the 2 by 4 is a rectangle, and no matter how we twist it, it's going to be a rectangle. Right? We're not going to allow deformation. We want the relationships of the parallel sides to stay the same. So here you can see as it twists, it's doing that. The second and more challenging problem were the rulings. So again, it's easy to make a barrel if you think about the curved piece that's going around, because cutting straight across will predictably bend in a straight way. It was figuring out how to communicate that angle to the computer and where to find it on a bent piece that was tough, at least for us. Um, I had a, an RA that started to read um, math thesis projects online. And he found one from the 1990s, I think, that tackled this problem. And it's really kind of an interesting one, we think, because it has to do with the tangencies. So if you had a line straight across a two by four, the assumption is that your two tangents would be parallel. And what we're running into as a problem is when the thing's twisting this way, your tangents aren't parallel anymore. Right? But kind of dumb answer is if you pull, pull this tangent back to a point where these two points on the parallel sides become parallel again, that's where that line is drawn across. That's where your axis of rotation is. So I actually have a video that begins to describe this. What that does, it allows us to find the axis and cut the teeth to it. 
this video basically shows what we're talking about. We have a bent piece of material. The computer locates tangencies on one side of that two by four. It then starts to do work on the other side, runs iterations of that test, and finds those points where those lines are tangent to one another. And then the hard part for us was figuring out then how to take a figural form and map it across a flat two by four so that we can then do the tooling on that piece, right? And if you just put a radius here, 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 here on down the board, that's basically showing a cut path for, um, for a mill. I can find my software here. So describing it another way, if I wanted to make a Mobius strip, I had to figure out how to take the Mobius strip and unfold it back into a two by four and then back again. Do the vector analysis using the software, finding those points across the body that would work, generating a tooth pattern, and then have the ability to unfold that tooth pattern so I could take a Kuka robot or a CNC mill cut the two by four so that when I steam them and put them together, they would bend exactly in space and meet in a way that would generate that Mobius strip. So that's, that's the problem we've been working on solving, and we've come a long way in solving it. We've become a little more sophisticated with our tooth patterns, so we're now into sinusoidal cuts and not faceted cuts. One of the reasons for doing that is we're dealing with a material, and anybody who knows anything about timber knows that wood grain basically is if you were to describe it in a really dumb way, it's like having a bundle of straws. It's the way wood behaves. These cuts are problematic because we're cutting across the end of the straws and we're trying to glue fibers together, together end to end. And what we really want to have a, the best connection we can have is to glue them side to side. So we're thinking now about how do we change the geometry of the cut to give us a better gluing surface which then allows us to get the bends that we're working on. We're starting to, to communicate with some folks in forestry to help us with that. There's a woman who researches gluable surfaces in timber, which is super useful to us. We're also thinking about the tools that begin to assemble this. So, so far, we've been doing this in an analog way with clamps, but we're making dumb models of zippering tools. But we're thinking about things like using radio frequency cured glue that allows us to connect those two pieces together in a really quick way. Cutting time is a big problem for us. Also thinking about using microwaves to bend the wood as opposed to steam, because steam's problematic. It takes time to steam boards. It takes time for those boards to dry out. Why do it? We have a really simple construction logic in two by four construction. So we could think about just really simple integrated disruptions in a wall. Doing that in a conventional way would be a really difficult and challenging thing. We could begin to think about changing two by fours or changing wall topography by basically starting with the element that's building the wall itself. Which brings me to the kind of concluding slides. Where's all this going? We're working on two projects. One's a wall and one's a pavilion. They're using the spanning plastic research, the zippered wood research, and then some other work that my group's doing in paper pulp concrete and also 3D printed waste where the students are building printers and printer heads to push different mediums through them. And this is the wall that we're gonna build in SIRS in the next three months if everything goes well. It's interesting to me because it's radically stupid. <laughs> it's stupid in that, you know, if, if anybody's worked on a construction crew, it's been around construction, Basically, a two by four wall has a base plate that's down low, usually two members deep. You have vertical studs that are 16 inches on center. They're just fired in, and then there's a header, right? All we're doing is bending the base plate. We're splitting it and bending it. We're learning from Corbusier. We're basically making hyper, two hyperbolic paraboloids that are back to back. But the idea is that with that limited amount of bend at the system, we're able to turn a flat wall into an occupiable space. And then what we're gonna do is, we've been playing around with iPhones and things like that. We can build the structural assembly, scan it with our phones, get a serviceable model into the computer, use that to generate simple formwork that allows us to inflate plastic around to put skin on it. 
So in theory, this project will be 100% built out of recycled material, but it'll be formally more sophisticated than the raw materials that are deployed now, which is the, the objective. And then we're going to hang boards and describe what we're doing, because we're interested in things like that. So that's, that's the project that we're working on for SERS. And then it's moving toward a complete pavilion, so basically building a building next to Le Serre that's occupiable, using really simple light frame construction techniques, but introducing bent numbers to come up with a form and a figure. This is early days. This is going to change, so it's in process. So that's basically all I brought to talk to you about, and I'm happy to field questions. Um, this kind, I would say that it's, well, I'm going to answer that in two ways. Building projects are massive undertakings, right? In this case, the pavilion that we saw there, we're actually working with the theater department. They're helping to generate the form that we're answering because we don't want to willfully just make something. It's a bigger challenge if I can't tailor my problem to myself. <clears throat> so in this case, this is a... Um, a pavilion that's designed around a couple of plays that they want to be able to put on and, and be thought of as a teaching space. And so that's really important and critical, like how people engage with this system. I will concede that the work that I'm doing on materials and things like that is very much targeted at the construction end of the process. But I'm also thinking about how I can move upstream and downstream to help introduce what you're asking about into the equation, not just users. And I'm thinking about the designers as well. So one of the pro projects, funding permitting, that I could see landing here is I'm dealing with software that's not super user friendly. So I'm trying to think, like, how could I, or how could I get help creating a kind of GUI or an interface between the form that I'm making, the manipulated output that talks to the CNC machine, but find a way to kind of flatten that experience for the majority of designers that don't know how to operate in Grasshopper. That's one version. Two, there's a, another version of the project, and one that I'm actually going to meet with somebody in an hour to talk about potentially landing here, that deals with AR and VR equipment, and how we can actually help people who want us to make space for them, experience and understand space in a meaningful way. So can I help a client walk around in this space? Can I, as a designer, use AR, VR gear, drop models into a system, move around a space, but actually tailor that space while I'm moving around in it, and then output to a tool? So I'm trying to flatten the experience, not just for a user, but for the person making the project. I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer. Sure. Sorry. Yeah, and there, there, are, there are people that wholly think about experience in space. I have a colleague that deals with, with um, pre-K students and how they experience space and how they relate to it. There are people working on that, but my expertise is here, and I would enlist her if I had a project that dealt with both parties. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm curious how this kind of improvisation on this mm -hmm. Um, it's a great question. Um, a couple of things. I'm interested in serendipity and I'm interested in improvisation, right? And so for me, there's another graph that I use that talks about suspending a final decision as long as I possibly can. And I had a, a mentor that described his job as that once early in my career. Is his job was to keep a question open as long as it could be open so that you could get more resolved answers to that question, right? Um, understanding that, there are issues that range from liability, like the ability to test and verify that these things will support weight and are safe for use, those types of things, 
all the way down to somebody just wanting to know what they're paying for, which is a big issue that we run into if we're thinking about research. I'm, my job is to help other people spend millions and millions of dollars and try to bend them to my way of spending those millions and millions of dollars, right? So I understand that there's a need for that predictability. Part of what I'm hoping to do with this process is build a tool set so that it can be a more predictable kind of outcome, but we're definitely experimenting to get to that point. Frank Gehry, does everybody know who Frank Gehry is? <coughs> architect, yeah. Um, he's a great example of somebody who started by willfully kind of, if you believe the Simpsons, crumpling up a piece of paper and turning it into a building. Um, he makes highly formal figural architecture. But what he did is he, Bill Bow, sort of his famous kind of, I think the public's most aware of that as his first project. He had 30 years of work prior to that moving towards Bill Bow. What he did is he started to generate his own software. He started to hire computer scientists to help him build the tools that he needed to use to generate these forms. He then started to um, have to outside train both architectural production people, but then begin to work with the uh, airplane industry, aer aeronautics industry, to make the pieces that he wanted making. You know, basically, I didn't say that well, but you understand where I'm going. Um, to the point where that's now unplugged, become, a, become its own business. It's a standalone because he had the problem solve on the in between. But I, I'm trying to say it's a, it's a sort of way that that serendipity kind of scaling up turns into something that then becomes adopted industry-wide as a way to manipulate things. And so formal projects are largely built on the back of his serendipitous research. OK, and on that note of serendipity, right. um, let's close the formal part of uh, this session. And if you have additional questions from there, perhaps um, you can stick around if you have to. So let's again thank Larry for the talk. Thanks.